Um, my name's Haley. I've met a lot of you here before, but there are a couple new faces, which is great. I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute, and we put on, basically we put on professional development opportunities for people working in various fields of ecology. So we put on courses, conferences, um, mostly we do that, but then we also do public talks like this every now and then. And we've been running this CRED Talk series for four seasons now, and um, we're partway through it. We've got a couple talks to come. And our next up in our talk, I'll just uh, let you know, is going to be Danielle Bachman. Um, she works with Parks Canada, and she's going to be speaking about wildlife mitigations and highway improvements in Glacier and Revelstoke National Park, what they've been doing there as, as they've been doing that really large um, construction project up there. And she'll be speaking next week, so Thursday, February 6th, in this room again at noon. And then what I want to do next is basically um, thank the Columbia Basin Trust for funding for this season of CRED Talks. And I'll introduce Miriam, which is who you're here to see. Um, before I do that, I want to just say thanks for coming on a powder day. It's pretty good attendance, all things considered. Uh, we had two classroom, two grade 11, or grade 11 and a grade 9 classroom in here just before you. Um, so it's great. I've been able to hear Miriam speak a couple times, and she's fantastic. Um, so Miriam Bruto, she's driven here this morning from Golden, um, and thanks for doing that on the on the snowy roads. She's currently doing her PhD work with the University of Calgary on wolverines, and she's been working in with wolverines for a bunch of years. Before that, she spent six years working with Tony Clevenger on wolverine road ecology research in the Canadian Rockies. Um, she's got a great deal of experience, and I'm sure she'll tell you more about herself, and, and you'll learn all about her work, so thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Um, who of you came to see the other talk with the film? Sweet, just a couple. So there's some repetition here. I tried to make it a bit more um, detailed, so I hope this is not boring. Yeah, I'll try to keep my personal things out of it after all these films and just talk about the work. Thanks so much for the Columbia Mountains Institute to have these presentations. It's pretty cool to be able to um, spread the word about wolverines quite a bit. And while well, right now I work on wolverines and it seems that all I do is wolverines, um, I do have some other interests too. But let's get started here. All right, so the talk um, is what's up with wolverines. 10 years and counting of wolverine research in the Columbia region. And I chose that title because my previous boss, Tony Clementry, gave a similar talk in Banff um, a little while ago, and I thought that was a good way to wrap it up. So we've been doing this research right now. I'm at the University of Calgary, um, but a lot of the research we've done before has been done by other people. In alphabetical order, there's a whole group of us, myself, Tony Clevenger, and Forstner Parks Canada, Doris Hausleitner and Andrea Cortello out of Nelson, Erin Jacob from Y2Y, Marco Muziani, my new supervisor, Garth Mott from Flynn Road, and Mike Sawaya out of Montana. So this is not just my research, obviously. I've been involved in a lot of it, but not everything. So, And the other thing before we start is I'd like to give a really big thank you to the funders. These are the people who are funding my current project, and um, it's a pretty big one, right? And I'm always looking for, for funding. And the biggest um, supporters are obviously the University of Calgary and CERC, Y2Y, and Parks Canada. But this project started with help from the Halley and Katsky industry, and you will recognize um, all those companies, obviously, and I'm really grateful for, especially for K3, for my Quigley Halley Skiing out of the river, for Southcourt Tangiers Halley Skiing, who are supporting us um, in a third year now, and Mustang Powder, the cat ski operation, but also to Halicot Canada, who's provided funding, Micah, Purcell, and Eagle Pass. Um, and then the other two funders, big funders, Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, and Forest Enhancement Society of British Columbia, BC Parks, Bovadi Naturalists, Earth Rangers. But then nearly our second biggest funder is private donations. 
I'm not sure why it fell down that much. So um, we got a lot of public help with this research. And I'm spending that much time on it because it sounds like last time I didn't do a very good job of that. So it's a very broad um, coalition of people who are supporters, and which makes it really interesting and challenging at the same time. So why study Wolverines? There's a lot of reasons. In my mind, why I spend so much time on them is because I think they're really cool. And they do have a lot of cultural significance for First Nations, but also for us, the new nations. Um, that when I say us, it's like probably most of you here who are not First Nations. Wolverines are pretty, are very popular animal. People love them. A lot of us identify with them, especially in mountain communities and forestry trapping communities. So we have a good reason to just want to study them. They're also a really good indicator species for healthy ecosystem, especially large, undisturbed, connected ecosystems. And then we have a couple legal reasons. So some of us here from Parks Canada, especially, have a mandate to study or to look after them because they got listed last year as special concern under Sarah. And in the US, they're under review for being threatened. So some of us study them because we really love them, and others have a mandate to do so. What are wolverines? I probably don't have to explain too much to you guys. They're the biggest land-living weasel. I always like to have the honey badger here because that's also a weasel that's probably one of the most well-loved weasels. Like, uh, like all carnivores, wolverines are scavengers. Uh, are like all weasels, wolverines are carnivores. They're scavengers and predators, and depending on where we, where they live, they scavenge more or they're, they're more on the predatory side. They can take down large things. It sounds like it's true that a moose has once been killed by a wolverine. I would think it's probably a rare occurrence, but they definitely take down, can take down adult ungulates occasionally. They will go after marmots, um, more smaller animals. And in some places, they're more scavenged, especially wolf kill. So they're only 10 to 15 kilograms, so pretty small, have a lot of attitude, which seems to be a weasel thing. And a lot of people say they're aggressive. I'm not sure that's really true. I don't think there's a whole lot of um, instances of aggression towards people, but they will definitely put on a pretty good attitude. That's probably why we like them. So there's a few things that are pretty special about wolverines. They're really small, but they're really more like grizzly bears, even though they're their size of a small, a small mammal. They have really low population densities. Um, we're finding now that it's about between five and ten times more grizzly bears than wolverines. Like good wolverine habitat versus good grizzly bear habitat, right? Like there's really if grizzly bears are rare, wolverines are extra rare. They're territorial. So females defend their own territory against other females, which is part of the reason why there's so few, and males do the same. Big territories for females, 100 to 500 square kilometers. And they have very low reproductive rates. Their reproduction depends on winter food availability for females. So in years where there's not a whole lot of food, they may just skip raising young. So they're often only have babies every two or three years. So that impacts density too. And especially the capacity to recover from uh, population issues. So all these means that they have big movements, big home ranges, and it means that we have to look at wolverines at a meta population scale generally. They need really connected habitats and refugia, and that's something that's been known for a long time, but it's really hard to do something about it. And the question really was for this talk, at this point, after all these years of studying wolverines, do we know enough? If we wanted to, let's say, make a good management plan or want to make sure that they're not um, disappearing. And it's a kind of a tricky answer. Some, some of, or all of you may be working in uh, wildlife management or resource management, and you know how that goes. If all I had to do was to consider wolverine's needs and the current state of the environment, yes, we'd know enough. We'd know exactly what to do to make sure that the wolverines do well, right? It's going to be a big park. Nobody can ever go there. We're like rehabilitating some like landscapes and leave them alone and we'll be all good. 
but of course that's not how the world works because all of us have needs we want to do business we want to go recreate people want their personal freedom not infringed upon so that makes my job more interesting because like probably most of you you're trying to balance society's needs with wildlife needs making tough decisions sometimes that go one way or the other and while always having to consider the current state of the environment, what have we done in the past. And yeah, so that often surprises people that think that scientists can just fix everything. No, we can just give solutions and then society has to decide whether they want to change anything or not. Um, so that means we don't know enough yet. I'll tell you what I know, what we know about wolverines, and I'll tell you what we're still working on. And hopefully by the end of it, you can see what we kind of where we, which direction we're going and what we still need to figure out to make sure wolverines can stay around in these mountains into the future. <coughs> um, I started putting in those slides because maybe that's not as important here with this group, but a lot of people aren't very familiar with a couple of basic concepts, which are habitat and connectivity. So wildlife need habitat connected by movement corridors. On the left side, there's two pieces of habitat with low connectivity. On the right side, connectivity is higher. And as a quick reminder, habitat is different for each species, right? And it just means the place or an area that provides food, shelter from elements and predation, space to do whatever they need to do, and opportunities to mate and to reproduce. So that's essentially habitat. It can be different for females and males of the same species. It can be different from for different demographic classes of the same species. It will be very different for different species. So habitat's one of these, a forest isn't just habitat, like it's habitat for something. So in this case, we're talking wolverine habitat, which could be very different from, let's say, grizzly bear habitat, but a lot of it overlaps. And then connectivity, of course, is also the buzzword, partly because the world's not, the world's pretty like, it's not everything is super connected. Like there's a lot of variation on the landscape in ecosystems, but humans have been really good of interrupting connectivity between, um, between natural landscapes on a global scale. And mainly we do that, we do so by building roads everywhere and highways, which makes it very difficult for some animals to, to move around. And we're good at building fences. I think that's a piece of fence down at the U.S. border between the U.S. and Mexico. Could be a pretty big obstacle, right? Or even just like small fences, farming fences. As you probably know, pronghorn don't jump, even though they could. They go underneath fences. So if the fences are too low, the pronghorn can't go underneath. And then it can't do their amazing, like, thousands of mile long migration. It's pretty easy to solve. Just take away the lowest wire and they can go through. And connectivity is reestablished. Um, yeah, we're good at building things like highway crossing structures, part of my previous work. So we have some solutions to improve connectivity between populations, but it's definitely one of the big conservation issues. And then as a reminder again, small isolated populations tend to go extinct. It seems that all my X's became question marks in this presentation. So. Whenever you see a question mark, it's supposed to be an X. And again, why are small populations more prone to extinction is because just stochastic factors, a disease, an avalanche, some bad winter, some wildfire can wipe out a small population readily. If it's connected to other parts, other populations or the better population, it's not a big deal. They can move back in. But if there's too much isolation, then populations will go extinct and at the end, maybe the whole species can go extinct. And species that have very large spatial requirements are particularly prone to these issues. And we're in Revelstoke. This is very good. There's a lot of very good wolverine habitat around us. To some, in some degree, we don't have to worry too much about them around here. But the kind of scale of wolverine conservation in BC is more continental rather than just local. Those three arrows they point to the three places where wolverines have re um, where have moved into the US again after they stopped trapping. The US essentially wiped out wolverines through through trapping and through I think it was um 
trying to wipe out wolves and putting out um, poisonous bait, which the wolverines would also eat. So wolverines have recolonized the U.S. through the, these three spots on the coast mountains, then in the southern Kootenays and southern Rocky Mountains. And as you'll see in a bit, right now, where those three arrows are, there's actually not very many wolverines left. So the next big place where there's wolverines is this area, the central uh, Columbia region is a pretty good hotspot, and it's supposed to be a good hotspot for the future. As temperatures warm, the Columbia region is supposed to keep its snow, so it's probably going to be a very good climate refuge for wolverines into the next 100 to 200 years. Um, the models don't go much further than that because we have no idea what's going to happen. So everything we do here has an impact on the American population. So in some senses, we do have a bit of a responsibility to make sure that they're, they're doing well here so they can help that small population down there um, survive. And I spent a lot of time crafting this beautiful, <coughs> this beautiful umbrella because I'm talking about a lot of different factors and I want to make sure that it's very clear that how we're studying wolverines. So all our studies really assume that we have a multi-use landscape. Even Banff National Park that's protected has a lot of tourists. So there's hardly any places around here that aren't used in multiple different forms, even if they're protected areas. So we always have a lot of different factors we have to consider. And like any species, we can't just look at one thing. What wolverines really need in this area, the main biggest factors are food, deep spring snowpack, um, appropriate levels of human disturbance, and appropriate levels of mortality, right? If one of these is out of whack, everything's going to not work. Food is mostly around here, is marmots, mountain goats, ungulates, and porcupines. That's what the females need. The males are a little bit less picky. The deep spring snowpack helps the females survive um, spring if they have their babies in the in snow caves very often in January. They keep them around until about April, May. So they're usually, wolverines are usually not found in places where there is no spring snow pack. So Cranbrook, probably not the best spot, so we shouldn't be surprised to not find them there. Human disturbance is a bit harder to gauge. And mortality, we have pretty good information um, on natural mortality and additional human cost mortality and how that correlates. But if any one of these isn't, um, isn't right, it doesn't matter how good everything else is, wolverines will have a hard time. <laughs> but in this talk, I will mostly talk about human disturbance, a little bit about mortality, and I won't really go into those things, but just um, be aware that we always have to consider the appropriateness of the habitat for the wolverines, and we wouldn't expect them in places where these things aren't given. So what do we do? We spent six years studying them um, in this yellow area. Down here is the U.S. border at the bottom, Highway 3, the Trans-Canada Highway, Glacier, Revels, Mount Revels National Park. And I didn't put uh, Lisa Larson, who's here, actually carried out the study there. So I forgot to put her as a co-author in the beginning. Um, and then Tony Clementer and I studied Wolverines in the Rockies. Andrea and Doris studied them in the Kootenays for a few years. And we tried to figure out how the populations are doing, how connectivity is given, and if they have an issue with the highways. And we did that using the beaver trees. You nail that beaver onto a tree, barbed wire on the tree trunk, and then when you're lucky, you get really amazing hair samples that we then analyzed for DNA um, to find the number of individuals to do genetic connectivity analysis and these kind of things. It works really well. Wolverines seem to be always hungry. And if you do it for long enough, you have a pretty good chance of getting most of the wolverines in the area. And the four main questions that we had. For Tony and I, it was really whether they cross the Trans-Canada Highway. All of us wanted to know how many there are. We wanted to know where they are and why. So like the distribution on the landscape. We wanted to know if harvest is sustainable. And we wanted to know where the breeding females are. Well, the last question is essentially my PhD project. So we wanted to know that after we, real we did the other four things, we're like, oh, we still don't really know where reproduction is occurring. So 
the answers are in a way really short. I'm always amazed like how long we study them and then how short the answer slides are. <laughs> so probably sounds familiar to you guys. Um, so do they cross the roads? In Banff and Yoho National Park, the Trans Canada has been pretty busy and there has been a lot of mitigation done, but when we did the study between 2009 and 13, those crossing structures um, along Kicking Horse Pass were really new, so Wolverines had not really had a chance to use them. Um, we didn't know if Wolverines crossed the road, and we never really saw them on the crossing structure cameras, so we did this genetic study. Um, the results are pretty striking. So for males um, using microsatellites, there wasn't really a distinction between north and south. They pretty freely crossed the highway, reproduced on the other side of the highway, so that wasn't that was what we kind of hope to see for everybody. For females, it was unfortunately a little bit different. So we didn't find a single female that was born on one side and was um, but then was reproducing on another side of the highway. So given the, the microsatellites, we could essentially assign we could essentially tell where whether they live on the north side or the south side. So that was kind of surprising because wolverines are known to um, have really long movements to be just going for places. They're seen downtown area occasionally. They go they go really random places, and we would have thought that the highway isn't that big of a of an obstacle for a wolverine. Um, highways are an obstacle for grizzly, female grizzly bears. So maybe it's not that surprising that female wolverines behave very similarly to female grizzly bears and seem to avoid, they seem to come to the highway, but then they don't seem to, and they seem to occasionally cross them, but they don't seem to go across it and um, procreate. And I won't talk about this much more, but part of my project now and part of a project that's ongoing, um, analyzing some data for the South, is to see whether what we find, found here was unique to Banff for a number of reasons, or whether we find the same thing here, whether we find the same thing across this highway here, um, across other highways, across other roads, and if this is something that we really should need to worry about, that the female part of the population is essentially chopped into small, very small little chunks. So stay tuned for that. We should have some more answers in a couple of years. The other question was, how many are there? That one's really easy. 166. And for this entire study area, we detected 126 over five years between all of us, and the estimate for the entire area um, is 166 individuals. As you can see, all the yellow dots are places where we didn't find wolverines. So the national parks seem to be quite busy, and as you go further south, it doesn't look so well. And I really wanted to put this in. I showed it to the high school students before. Um, hopefully, you guys are into spatial capture recapture. So how do we do all these analysis? We generally use spatial capture recapture models for a lot of it because they seem to be so um, so flexible. And because the question is always like, if you have a population of animals, how are you going to count them? And those of you who do this work know what I'm talking about, right? You can't go out and count them physically usually because it would be too challenging. Fortunately, they all have a home range. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of how we could look for them and where we should look for each individual. And essentially what spatial capture recapture does, it looks at where individuals are found and where they're found again, and then estimates using hierarchical models where they're living and where they're not living. And it estimates how many individuals um, do we find and how many are we missing to give us a density number. And it's really a, quite a simple um, concept. Like if we assume that this is the home range of an animal, we I want to introduce the concept of probability of detection, right? Depending where you're looking for an animal, if each dot is a camera station, if you're looking out here, you're probably not going to find it because it doesn't live here. If you're looking in the middle of its home range, you're going to have a really high chance, if you have good methods, of finding the wolverine or any other mammal or species for that matter. So this is the probability of detection in the center of the home range. And as you go away from the home range center, the probability of detection generally becomes lower. And the shape of that curve depends on the species, the territorial species. It will be pretty, you will still find it, find it, find it, find it, and not find it anymore, right? 
And other species, it will be a bit more gradual. They will have an area where they like to be most, and then as you go further away from that center, you won't detect them anymore. So here, further, further away from the home range center, the probability of detection is lower. And this kind of concept we take advantage of to do, uh, to estimate how many animals are there, how many are we missing, and it's a pretty cool, a pretty useful tool to ask all sorts of ecological questions like, do they go across highways? Do they do a lot of these different things? Do they, like, is their density affected by underlying habitat factors? So this concept is what half of my PhD is going to be based on. And I don't want to spend too much time, but if we do have, like, six wolverines and we put out sampling stations, right, we're only going to find them in some stations. And as all scientists know, like sometimes we actually don't find them when they should be there. But as all scientists know, that's not what we see. That's what we get. We never see the truth. We only see what we're sampling, which is kind of the big challenge of every scientist's life. And then we're trying to make sense of what we're seeing and try to figure out if the underlying data looks like this or like this or like this. And those um, and those models, especially the spatial capture recapture models, um, essentially it's just maximizing the likelihood that this is the right data for what we're seeing. It just goes through all these different steps, trying to figure out is this the right one, is this the right one, and at some point um, it will we will decide that okay, this looks pretty good, right? There's, a, there's one here, there's a few up there, there's a couple here, so there's six animals that, that live here. Reality is maybe like this, but that's pretty good, right? And so, as you guys all, also all know, is there's always a trade-off between getting, getting really precise results and not spending too much money. So ideally we'd have that many. Ideally we'd look everywhere, or we'd have like double the number of sampling stations. But there's always kind of limitations to how much we can actually do with the money that we do have. So we're trying to get as much information as we can um, and really good information, but not spend too much money on sampling, resampling things that we already have enough information about. But yeah, the more data we have, the more information we can give the models and the better our results. Okay. So this is how we did the next three things. Where are Wolverines and why? This is essentially where we found them. So this is the region where we estimated 166 animals, approximately. Um, it includes the Big Bend area here. It goes all the way up to, um, to past the David Thompson Highway. And as you can see, the dark places are where wolverine density is higher, and white is where there's hardly any. And you can see this really big white belt um, towards the US border, where we literally found like a couple dozen animals, maybe less. So there's a lot of areas, and most of this is wolverine habitat. It's not that this is bad habitat. It's supposed to be wolverine habitat. It used to support harvest, but they're gone for whatever reason from a lot of areas. But then there's other areas where there's really quite a high density. And fortunately, the Selkirks are part of it. So we're kind of in the wolverine hotspot here. And the two major, the two major, or the two biggest factors for wolverine density was spring snow cover, which we kind of expected, but we never, sh nobody's ever been able to show that it affects density, and road density, forestry road density. So the more forestry roads, the fewer wolverines, and the more spring snow, the more wolverines. So the right side, that's nature. Can't do much about that. We can't increase the snow. The left side, that's us. Um, but it's kind of a difficult result. So it's like, okay, we shouldn't have roads, but why? Like, they're not scared of the roads. Are the roads a proxy for forestry and changes in ecosystems, like for caribous that maybe lose food sources? Are the, are the roads just a means of access? Like, if nobody ever used the roads, would the roads be a problem if the forestry has already happened? So that's the kind of, that's the big question we're trying to answer now, um, is why are roads a problem and can we do anything about it? And I'll come back to that in a in a moment here. 
And then the last, the fourth question is harvest sustainable. I won't spend too much time on this. Wolverines are harvested, um, but the, they're not harvested in most places. Like the trappers know if they don't have any wolverines, they don't try to capture them, right? So there's not very much harvest going on down here. But because the wolverines are so unevenly distributed, um, um, and because they do travel long distances to, to re recolonize places, what happens up here where there's lots of wolverines may actually impact the number of individuals that are available to get pushed out to come down here. So just because um, there may be a lot of wolverines around here doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have an impact to places that are much further away because dispersal distances for females and males can be hundreds of kilometers. So that's why wolverine harvest should be looked at in a big area. And so the max harvest rate that can be sustainable is about 8% per year. That doesn't allow for any recolonization. And in the Kootenai region, it's about 8.4 right now. So a little bit too much. It's only about 10 to 12 animals that get harvested each year in the Kootenai region. And so it's not, it's not like most trappers don't harvest wolverines. So it's not necessarily a very big um, problem. So we recommended that the harvest gets lower to about 4% and ideally maybe stopped for a while. So those southern places have a chance to recolonize, right? If we keep some more juveniles alive here, they have more pressure to move somewhere else and hopefully recolonize those areas. But that's not up to us, right? That's up to the to the government to make those changes. Right now there's a propose a proposal from the government. They have done quite a bit of um of consultation with the trapping community to close the wolverine harvest in region four for the time being and see whether um, um and we'll see whether it happens. I'm not involved in that, so I'll be curious to see. But the thing is, it's not just the harvest, right? We've seen that wolverines are also not found in places where there's lots of roads. So there's some other things that unfortunately we have to think about. So after all these years, do we know enough to do a management plan? We got the food covered, the spring snow covered, the mortality covered. There's some changes potentially in, um, in harvest management in this region. And again, th what we found that applies to harvest here, not anywhere else, right? We can only talk about the place where we actually studied it. So, but what we really don't know is the human disturbance factor. And why are the roads an issue? And human disturbance is everything from forestry to people to uh, roads to just disturbance, right? Human activities. Um, it could be really anything that's going on. So the fifth question, where are the breeding females? I'm often asked why breeding females? Uh, why is that particularly important? Um, and the answer is, well, females make babies. Babies are needed to have a population. So if there's no breeding females around, then there won't be any reproduction. There won't be a population. And like a lot of other mammals, the females are really quite sensitive to a lot of these impacts. Males are, the wolverine males are trying not to be bothered by a lot of things, but the females seem to be really quite picky. They need very specific habitat where they can actually raise their young in winter and spring that it's safe habitat. Um, so they're much, much dis more discerning than males. And so what we need to, we essentially need to know what we need to do to keep breeding females around and the males will come. So that's kind of how this goes. And now it gets serious because we're in Revelstoke and everybody either skis or snowmobiles or heli skis or has a sled or a quad or something, me included. While we were studying wolverines, um, there was a winter recreation study happening in Idaho where wolverine biologists and the ski touring community and the snowmobiling community teamed up together because they wanted to figure out there's not very many wolverines in the US. There's not very many wolverines in Idaho. It's a couple dozen or maybe three dozen. So they're pretty, they're pretty vulnerable and people want to do what they can to keep them around. So they're like, well, we're using the same winter habitat. So let's see what impact we have. So these three groups worked together. The wolverines were forced to participate, but they got given radio colors and ski tours and snowmobilers voluntarily took GPSs with, out with them for over a number of winters, over a number of time. And then they looked 
at whether how those three groups interacted. Um, this is um, this is from the Grand Teton area from I think the winter. This is all ski touring tracks, right? So yeah, the idea was to figure out how these three groups interact. Is there a problem between um, the breeding females and those user groups? And the results were quite interesting. The males stayed away from when there was a lot of recreation, but and that was within their home range, right? They could only look that if they did it that way, they could only look that in the home range of the female that's pretty stationary over time, over the years. Would the wolverines um, avoid areas that are heavily used by people? So the males that didn't, they were a little bothered, but it didn't matter too much to them. The females, they were pretty okay with, uh, with low levels of intensity of ski touring and mechanized um, <coughs> um, snowmobiling recreation. This is all recreational. I mean, there's maybe some tours, but this is not tenure based. This is all just public land. But when the levels got really high, wh whether it was ski touring or it was snowmobiling, the females avoided those areas until spring when the snow was gone and the people were gone. So that essentially meant that in the very heavily used areas, the females lost a lot of their habitat within their home range. They were still able they were still living there. The study only lasted five years, so it's hard to know what the long-term consequences are for a female. Is she more or less likely to be successfully breeding if she has a lot of disturbance in her home range or not? You couldn't tell that. So they stuck around, but they avoided large areas over the months where they were busy. And once this all came out and we finished our, our study, that's how I formed the question that then became a PhD. It's essentially human impacts on female wolverines. And yeah, so in Idaho, we found that breeding female wolverines avoid humans inside their territories. But what we really want to know is whether these same impacts um, and other impacts that we know are important, like the roads, like changes in habit, like potential changes in like the ecosystems through forestry, whether this also affects where the females establish their territories. That means like how many territories there are in a landscape. Do we lose some wolverine habitat because it's too affected by human factors? How do we have a lower density of, of female wolverines in places where there's a lot of these of these things? And but what we really don't know, and what's a big part of this project that people don't often hear about is we don't know how much human disturbance there is and where. Like the forestry data is pretty well available. But it's not really mapped out on those big scales, like how much, like it's like putting together, like how much recent clear cutting has to be done, like how many, like how does the underlying habitat actually look? There's zero large scale data for ski touring or snowmobiling or even heli skiing, like there's data available, but it's not publicly there that we can actually go and look. So. How much heli skiing is there? Like when you look at the tenure maps, it's everywhere. Like the entire mountains are heli ski tenures, but they're not skiing everywhere, right? Like there's large areas they never use. So nobody really has a sense for any of these things. Um, when you're in Revelstoke, you see all the sleds, but when I'm flying over the landscape, there's a lot of areas with no sled tracks. So it's like, in order to be able to look at that, we need to even look if, how much of these different factors there are and also how they compare because the people in Idaho, they said, well, if there was too much ski touring, it's like, what's too much? Is that 10 a day? Is that 1,000 a day? So we need to, so that's something we're working on to try to calibrate what we're finding here to what they've been finding. And then looking at how much will re-inhabit that remains and where. And so essentially, I'm trying to figure out, does the population look like this? If this is the entire mountain range. The blue is whatever human factor we're studying, whether it's skiing, ski touring, or um, recent clear cutting, or it could be mining in other places. Do the wolverine or skiing, do the wolverines kind of live wherever they have good habitat, or does it more look like this, right? That they really avoid them, which would mean there would be way less space available for them because each female needs a specific size. So if suddenly you lose all those areas, you only have half the 
happy that available. So you can only have half the number of females. That means you can only have the re reproduction. That means everything is just a little bit less awesome. So that's essentially what we're doing. And how, are, how am I doing that? We're not using the beaver tree anymore because we have way fancier methods now. I get to use photos. So we went up to wooden structures. So next step in Wolverine um, research. So one cool thing about Wolverines is that they have individual fur patterns. So taking photos from the front, we can ID them at different spots, and we don't need to do DNA analysis for every single site. So we get a lot more information. And also, I didn't show the photo here, when they spread their legs, we can see whether the females are, are lactating. That's the only way to tell that a female is reproducing without capturing her. So what we're doing is we're trying to take photos of all the wolverines we can possibly find, <coughs> see whether they're male or female, see whether the male is an adult or a juvenile, look whether the female is lactating, and we have to do that over three years at least, because they may not lactate every year, they may only have um, young every two or three years. And we do collect hair um, on barbier to get DNA, but yeah, we still use beavers, the wolverines are still hungry, and it's been pretty successful. So I've done two years of field work. This is my study area. Down here is Revelstoke. That's the Bugaboos, Golden, the park, all the way up to Vailmont Robson. And the good news is that we found quite a few females already. So we found probably as many individuals already, 128, as in the entire, like, place to the U.S. border, which is a much bigger area, which is like twice or three times the area. So, and we didn't sample everything. Down there we sampled everything. Here we didn't sample, you know, just places that have gaps. So it's pretty encouraging. It also looks like, yeah, it looks like there's a good number of breeding females. Again, virtually all of this is Halley tenure. So the good news is, like, if Halley tenures were toxic to wolverines. We wouldn't have any wolverines here. So it looks pretty promising that it seems that they can um, that they can make a living here still. But it's going to take us a while to finish. Like there's still a lot of white stars. The white stars are animals that I think are females that I haven't seen lactating yet. So I'm not sure yet if these are breeding females or if these are just juvenile females. There's a few females who look very young. But we did find a whole number of breeding females we found a breeding female um, just left up here, all through the Boulder Mountain um, Eagle Pass snowmobiling area. So that's pretty that's pretty cool, right? We weren't sure if we should expect that or not. So it seems that you know I don't want to I don't want to make answers at this point because we have a, a ways to go to see how things actually look. But generally, it looks like this area that has a lot of recreation and um, commercial winter tourism going on has much more Wolverines than in the south. So I'm really glad about that. We kind of hoped, we kind of expected that, but I'm really glad we did find that many Wolverines. So we're going to go into pretty as much detail as we can to see whether, um, yeah, what are the factors that make us find Wolverines in some places. I mean, the worst case is that we find breeding females at every single one of my sites. Then, um, Will, then we won't be able to answer the question of what keeps breeding females away because they're everywhere, right? That would be the worst case for my awesome publication, but it would be the best case for the wolverines. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm hoping is that we don't really, like that all those black points that had males but no females, we hope that um, all of this get filled by stars. Like that would be the ideal, it would be, yeah. It wouldn't be ideal to like figure out where they're not because they're everywhere. But that's essentially what I hope, right? I'm not trying to, I'm not hoping that they're really all that strongly affected by, by things. Um, but another thing is too that a lot of those places where we have found them also don't have roads yet. But they have a lot of, um, people recreating and working in those mountains. So, Maybe we will have a little bit of, hopefully we get some clear answers, like what are the big things we do have to worry about um, if we do want to keep wolverines around. And again, for this area, it's not that we're immediately worried about them. 
it's more that we're trying by stunning them in a place where there is still a healthy population. These are 27 breeding females, right? Like between Belmont, Revelstoke, Golden. We didn't find like 500, it's like 20 salmon. Found 130 animals. So each animal counts, but we couldn't do the same study in the south because there may only be like 12 females, 12 breeding females. And it's very hard to do statistical analysis with such little sample sizes. Just because one female does one thing or not the other doesn't mean that all the females will do that. So that's partly why we're working here because we knew there should be a decent population. We knew there should be a lot of places where only one of the, of the many different factors goes on, like this places where there's only snowmobiling, where there's only forestry, where there's no trapping, where there's only like ski touring, but nothing else. So I've been trying to really sample in a way that allows us to answer question, which was impossible to do in the South, because usually when there was forestry, there was also recreation and there was also everything else. You can't, um, yeah, you can't tell what the problem is. So, so yeah, we got another winter to go. Um, and then I'll take a couple of years to, to make beautiful mm -hmm. models and great papers saying that Wolverines are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't find a female on camera, but we may have found a male. White star. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have gone through it a bit better. The white stars are females that are not lactating, but I haven't. I'm not a hundred percent sure with all the white stars whether they're really a female or just a juvenile male. Sometimes it's hard to see. Like you can tell apart the big males because you can see their uh, their penis. You can see their um, not the penis, that where it's inside, and then you can see the balls really well. The lactating females. You can also see, like any mammal that has young, you can just see the teeth. The young males are harder to recognize because usually they're, they're, um, they're, what's the word for balls? The testicles are very small, so you don't really see them. So you need a pretty good picture of the belly to see whether it's a female or a male. And the young females are the hardest, or females that aren't lactating are pretty hard because you don't see anything. Old females, you can see the teeth a little bit, even if they're not lactating sometimes, depending on the photo. But the young females are really the biggest challenge, like the ones that haven't had um, young yet. So there's a number of those white stars that I think are females, but where I'm not fully sure, certain yet. Um, but all the colorful stars are females that I'm sure that I've seen lactating. They may have lost their young, they may not have been successful, but at some point in spring they were lactating. You can see it in March, April, and May really well. There were a couple females, three females lactated in both 2018 and 2019, but all the other ones, the other 25, only lactated in one of the two years, but not in the next year or not in the previous year. So we expect that, but that's also something we're curious to like test. Is it really true that they all only have young every second or third year? And so far it seems to look like that. So this, this third year should help us. We're going to focus on all the females that we haven't been able to see whether they're breeding females yet. But we also have hair samples from most animals, so we should be able to determine their sex also from the genetics. Um, so especially for the ones that are juveniles, if we get a good hair sample, we can tell what sex they were. So it's a really good combination between the cameras and the DNA to get a lot more information than just from the DNA, and it's not that much more work than putting out the beaver trees. The expensive thing and the hard thing is to get those places. And as you can imagine, that's partly why we work with the heli and the cat ski industry is that we're flying to all these places because it would be it would be not it wouldn't it would be more expensive and it wouldn't really be feasible to really access those places on the ground between February and um, and May. And also I found that especially the heli ski industry like the guides, they have a lot of knowledge about the wildlife in the area. So I've learned a ton um, also about like goats and things and wolverines. I've learned a ton from from that industry about what they're seeing, right? Because I'm not spending all my time, right now I do, but I haven't spent like the last 20 years flying around those mountains. But there's people who have. So working with trappers, working with those heli ski guides and cat ski guides and ski touring guides has been really quite successful so far because they have so much as a group, they're essentially a wolverine biologist. So, so the wolverines, if I understand, are pretty well full blown after year one. Yeah. So some of those could be juvenile females, maybe? Yeah.
Yeah, there could be juve females don't they can get pregnant by year one. There's never there's never really been like they don't really successfully breed until year three usually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're fully grown, but they're not it's not necessarily established mature breeding females yet. Uh, which creek? Script. Script Creek is here. Um, I think here, here, here. Yeah. And then I noticed the, below that dot, down to the next dot. Yeah. There's a big space that you know, stands in that area on the west side of the lake. If I had more funding, I would. I've been hoping to find funding to move some of the sites to the left side because we'd love to sample more. But again, I was limited with how much funding I had. So I have a lot of information about the Big Bend area. So I could, if I get enough funding for flights, I'll move the cameras. Cameras are expensive too, so I'm a bit limited with that too. I'll move some of those sites to the west side to fill in some of those gaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going north on Street yeah. to the west, a lot of that area is in Region 3. Exactly, yeah. That will be Region 3. Um, well, there's a couple of females, like that's mostly my Willis Tanya, we fly around with them quite a bit. So, um, there's definitely Wolverines. I would say the hot spot of everything we've done in the last 10 years is here. Like, I would say this is kind of um, where I would call it a little bit of a hot spot, like just outside or in Glacier, uh, Mount Revelstoke, and just north of those mountains. That's kind of... So north of the Revelstoke Park and then the South Lake Wall. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder if South Lake Hunters feeds them or something, because it essentially matches with their tenure. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yep. Those areas where you're in water, yeah, that could be like food. That's 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 the, an important question to ask. Partly, it's because in some places we only looked one year, so this is not a totally fair one. So in the east and in the Rockies, we only we didn't sample there in 2018. We only sampled in 2019, so we have half the data. Versus this area, we sampled two years. So that's the thing. We need at least two years in an area to have a good chance to find female breeding females. But also, um, it could also be that there's not enough food. So that's one thing we'll have. And that's why I don't want to take this and make conclusions, because we also have to look at the underlying food. Like, there may just not be good breeding female habitat, and then we shouldn't be surprised if there's no breeding females. Or the one black dot here, um, the trapper who has that trap line, told me that he caught the breeding female, like, two months by not really like, right, like he didn't intend to catch her, but he caught her like two months before we put our cameras out. So I would, it can take a year or two or three until a new breeding female moves in. So some of these things are really good to know, right? Like it's not that this is bad habit, it's just that the breeding female was unlucky enough to go into a trap. So that's these things we need to consider and we try to consider as much as we can because you can't just sample once and then say like, oh, this and this and this, right? It could be, there's a few factors we have to consider and we're working hard on getting those data sets ready so we can make, yeah, so we, we're not making like uninformed, um, bad, like bad conclusions that aren't really real. So it's been really successful so far. Um, um, we have gotten a lot of support. Some people in here are helping us and uh, we can have a few questions here. I just want to wrap up. Really thank you to our funders. It's not a cheap project and it's very logistically involved. It's also a little bit challenging because, you know, like if you support a project, you may get criticism later on, right? Some healthcare companies may be a bit more nervous about that than others. Some companies, right? Like it's, it's not always easy to actually support these kind of projects because people can be worried that it may backfire. And I really do hope this is not the case. Um, um, yeah. And if you guys want to join the coalition, we're still looking for funders like crazy. 
This is our website, lots of information, there are films there. Um, I forgot to bring the cards, but please go there. You don't have to type to support us in. You can just go to the website and enjoy the, the fun stuff. But if you or your company or your industry wants to support us, um, we're still like getting in touch because we're still needing a lot of needing a lot of helicopter hours for this winter. So, so Thank you.